Hello, my name is Lee Anderson. I'm a professor and associate dean at the University of Washington in the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance. And I am here at the Data for Policy Conference in London, at University College London, with Quentin Palfrey. And uh, Quentin has uh, agreed to answer a few questions for us about what has brought him to the conference and what he believes is important in this field. So could I get you to introduce yourself to the... Sure. Thanks so much for having me, Lee. My name is Quentin Palfrey, um, and um, I've spent some time uh, over the last decade or so thinking about some of the issues around data and policy. I was in the White House under President Barack Obama um, and worked in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, and at that time, we were working on um, trying to introduce some baseline privacy legislation. Um, and uh, we introduced it in the Senate. It didn't uh, make it through the U.S. legislature. Um, and now that set of issues is back again on the, uh, on the public stage. Um, I'm working um, as a senior senior fellow at the Future for Privacy Forum. Um, and uh, we're, um, we're closely monitoring some of what's happening in terms of setting the rules of the road. Um, but we're also giving a fair amount of thought to um, how to make sure that we um, uh, that we monitor um, some of that behavior um, and um, how we make sure that people can have trust in what happens online. So how do you feel like the, the themes of this conference, in particular around ethics, are relevant to the project that you're launching? Yeah, so I mean, I think that we have um, this sort of extraordinary explosion of innovation. So much of our lives are now being lived online. So if you think about now relative to, say, 30 years ago, um, when we have uh, babies, when we have uh, uh, marriages, when we have engagements, we announce them online. Um, increasingly, our health care um, is made Manage through digital information or economy. Uh, we buy things, we sell things online. Um, and, and so um, it's really transforming every aspect of our lives. But at the same time, um, the, we, the rules um, that relate to um, how that data is governed um, are very much a patchwork. It depends very much where you live, what kind of data you're talking about. So where, how your data is handled um, could depend uh, in the United States on which state you're in. Um, we now have a, a number of states trying to introduce uh, privacy legislation and set those rules. We have sector-specific uh, legislation. Um, and then internationally, the Europeans are, um, have, have moved forward with uh, GDPR. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a whole different regime um, from a lot of what's handled in the United States. Um, that patchwork of rules creates some real challenges um, for uh, businesses. It creates real challenges for uh, users. Um, and it makes it really hard to sort of know what the rules are at any given time. Um, and, you know, if you think of trust as sort of the foundation for how people um, uh, how people sort of interact online and how we can make sure that uh, we get that balance right. Um, the lack of clear rules of the road make it very difficult for us to have that. Um. So, so I think the theme of trust is important. And sort of two questions here, I guess. One is, do you think that the, tr the level of trust affects people's willingness to trade off some privacy for security? And, and if so... Um, how that, that helps a, a government and its mandate to keep its population secure. And then the second question is, secure from whom, I guess, is, is, is something that's uh, maybe a different conversation now than it was even a decade ago. So there's security from the private sector and using your data and collecting your data without consent, but there's also security from the public sector in the sense of people being concerned about how their data are being used in... Um, in regimes where our usual senses of freedom are, are being challenged today. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that. I, I think both aspects are in, 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 increasingly important. Um, certainly the trust that we had um, in uh, the relationship between the government and our data was broken um, in the context of uh, some of the revelations that came about as a result of um, Edward Snowden's disclosures. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things I was really proud of, of um, in working on in, in, in the White House was the relaunch of something called the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which was meant to be a mechanism for um, for balancing some of those uh, some of those important 
government surveillance activities with some of the rights that folks, uh, you know, th that we need to protect in a democracy. So I think we have not yet gotten the balance between government surveillance and um, uh, and, and user rights uh, quite right. Um, but I think also in the commercial space, um, certainly Cambridge Analytica uh, is is mm -hmm. an is is an example that's in the front of people's minds. Um, but I think there are a number of other ones. I mean, I think that um, you know we've seen um, situations where people um, uh, find that uh, uh, their data trail reveals a pregnancy or mm -hmm. um, other sort of intimate health uh, secrets um, in ways that people feel very uncomfortable with. And I do think that that has a chilling effect. I think if you look at the data um, and the you know the poll uh, the polling information, what we see is that a lot of people feel uh, that they've lost control of their of their user information. I think that in a lot of instances, people are willing to make trade-offs um, and are willing to participate um, in um, sort of online life. Um, but I do think that there's this undercurrent of anxiety about what happens and about how that's going to be treated both by the government and by commercial actors. And I think that that does, uh, that anxiety um, has a chilling effect on um, people's uh, behavior online and can, can also make it hard um, for, for businesses to kind of get their balance right. Um, I also think that when you have unclear rules of the road, and in, in the United States, we don't have a baseline privacy legis legislative re regime. Um, you know, when you have unclear rules on the road, it also advantages unscrupulous actors over uh, more responsible businesses. Mm -hmm. So if you have businesses with a general counsel's office who are willing to adhere to best practices, who try and build up um, mechanisms inside their, um, uh, their, their commercial environments to adhere to some kind of rules, um, uh, they often have to compete against rogue actors who um, are willing to push those envelopes, um, and and that you know the, you don't want a system where you um, where where the advantage uh, the commercial advantage is in, on the side of people who are willing to to break rules or push push the envelope or hurt people. Right, and and you were writing about a lot of this seven years ago when you were in the Obama administration, and I'm wondering. I want to ask about the, the whole notion, which is a little bit tangential, but the notion of automation and the displacement of jobs, because I think that's a, that's a big policy theme. It's not as much a focus of this year's conference, but I know for data and policy in general, it is important. How do you, and I know that you've also thought about international issues in previous work as well. So do you think that, that our policies are able to keep pace, or do you feel like relative to seven years ago, this has happened more quickly than people could have anticipated, and do you feel that that's also a role for policy in terms of trying to think about the job creation and the uh, the human impact of these other these technologies that can be beneficial but do have a there's a there's a timing issue, right? We we can't adjust so quickly. I, I think there's a huge timing issue. I mean, so I, I believe very strongly in the ability of government to be a positive force in people's lives, but it does move more slowly. Um, mm -hmm. The laws uh, and 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 you know uh, both legislative and judicially uh, built legal systems take a lot longer um, than technological innovation. And the internet is one of the places that you see this. You also see this in other kinds of technological disruption, like automation or AI. Or you know, mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of uh, you know, um, personalized medicine, a whole whole bunch of sort of exploding um, uh, fields where it takes a while for the legal regime to kind of catch up. And one of the things that happens is then you've got a period of time where it's the wild west, right? Mm -hmm. You've got a period of time um, where there are opportunities for innovation that are. Um, are, are, are created and are in some ways fueled um, by a regulatory environment that's a little bit looser, um, but you also have lots of opportunities for uh, misconduct and for consumers or users to get harmed. Um, I do think that there's, uh, so government has to sort of constantly be trying to catch up and um, public policy um, and p folks in universities have to sort of help uh, think through, well, what is the next step? How do we, how do we govern these regimes? Regimes, but I also think that there's a really important role for nonprofit entities, for uh, self-regulatory entities that have some teeth, that you know, um, to sort of try to fill in some of those gaps. So um, let me give you an example in the in the space of commercial data privacy, mm -hmm. which is the subject of this. Um, 
of this conference, you know, you think about um, some of the challenges that consumers are facing in data privacy, um, and you've got these really big entities like the Federal Trade Commission and state attorneys general in the United States. You've got a number of regulators in Europe um, that are able to kind of use law enforcement tools to enforce bad behavior. And then you've got some of these big corporate entities, um, you know, platforms like Google's and Facebook's and Apple and Microsoft and some of those entities trying to kind of enforce their rules, their platform terms, and sometimes getting in trouble with the, the law enforcement the regulators mm -hmm. for not doing that strongly enough. But then you've got this huge ecosystem of developers, of apps, of extensions, of plugins um, out there in, um, you know, in garages, right? Some of them are huge and some of them are really very small, offering their services, uh, being integrated into these very big um, systems. From a user perspective, often you don't know whether you're dealing with a big platform or you're dealing with some kind of an extension or some kind of an app. Um, but from the perspective of trying to make sure that those um, entities are uh, are, are doing things that we would want them to do, it creates a real challenge in terms of how you make sure. So take Cambridge Analytica, for, for example. Mm -hmm. Cambridge An Analytica was a, a third-party entity within a larger ecosystem, right? And so the question is, what do you do about making sure that you're sort of getting ahead, that you're leaning forward, that you're sort of raising the bar in terms of the behavior of those entities, and how can you do it in a way that distinguishes between good and bad behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Because what we don't want to do is we don't want to shut down everything because we're afraid of some things, right? Mm -hmm. So this is something that, so I have three kids. Um, I have a 10-year-old, an eight-year-old, and a two-year-old. Um, and, you know, in the, in, in the space of, of kids' privacy, um, sometimes there's this tendency to sort of shut everything down, right? Mm -hmm. To say, we need, we need to wall them off from the world, right? And that's not actually what we want to do. What we want, actually want to do is we want to enable them to use the tools that are, uh, that, that are emerging, the wonderful uh, educational tools, the wonderful educational and cultural opportunities that have in the Internet. And we want to make sure that we're very you know, protective of their rights and their security and that we prevent bad actors from, um, from exploiting them. But we don't want to say, well, okay, let's just make sure that, you know, uh, let's make sure that they're in this sort of walled, walled off space. Well, if you're going to be nimble and you're going to distinguish between good and bad actors, then you've got to have an ability um, to really lean in there and look at what people are doing and distinguish between good and bad. But then you need a much more complicated system. Right. And I have teenagers, so perhaps that's why I use a precautionary principle, but the same thing applies. You can't, you can't wall them off. So the last question I want to ask is, um, what do you hope to take from this Data for Policy conference? I know you've been here before. Um, you're back again. You're on a new adventure. What is, what is it you're looking for to take away? So I think that the, the, the issues around uh, data, data and policy and particularly um, some of the issues that we're dealing with this year with respect to commercial data policy are increasingly global. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the, as, as I was talking about before, we have these sort of patchworks of uh, legal regimes, of protections, but we have a totally interconnected system. Um, and that's true of the policy community as well. Um, we need to have uh, folks who are in the United States, folks who are in Europe, folks who are in uh, Asia and other parts of the world, sort of working together, putting our heads together, rationalizing the systems that we're creating, learning from our innovation experiments. And so, so I think that there's a really important role for conferences like Data for, for, uh, for Policy in terms of bringing people together, uh, highlighting best practices, talking about what we're trying to sort of incubate and launch and, um, and create in these, in these systems and, and, and opening up the channels of communication among people who are working on, on complementary issues. So I think that, you know, I hope to offer some of my own thoughts uh, in this conference, um, but I'm hoping to, um, to also learn um, from other folks who are coming um, from all over 
over the world um, and to you know meet uh, meet future colleagues and uh, so I think that that's one of the real uh, really important convening roles that uh, a conference like this can yes can and it's uh, from the session this morning it's multidisciplinary it's multi-sector and it's international so it's very exciting and thank you so much yeah for thank you Lee. taking the time I enjoyed and our conversation yeah, and too. look forward and to seeing you over the next couple of days exactly thanks Quentin thanks